used to have Bright House, um, we would always set our TVs to record our favorite shows on Shark Week. So we would watch to see what was coming up and set our TVs for Shark Week and all that kind of stuff. And so um, it's just so neat. Um, but you know, our first year in ministry, um, I know you were there, Rebecca, and maybe a couple others might have actually been there that first um, year we had started our ministry. Um, but when Shark Week came around, do you remember that? We talked about Shark Week and we had like a big graphic up there for Shark Week and we had brought in a, um, a big armored guy and um, we talked about the armor of God. And so it was really neat because we were talking about how Satan likes to attack. And so Satan was kind of like that shark. And so the evil forces of the world represented the shark and our armor of God represented the armor of God that we put on to defend ourselves against the sharks. And so that's what we talked about. And it was really neat because that year we actually had live sharks swimming in the sanctuary. Now, I know you probably think that's kind of crazy, but they were just little Bela sharks. So, so they weren't that big. But we advertised that we were going to have live sharks swimming in the sanctuary. Do you remember that? And we had a little tiny fishbowl at the top. And people would come in the door and they'd be like, where's the sharks? And we're like, right there, that little fish tank. And so it was kind of neat. But, you know, but we called around. We tried to get sharks in there, but uh, nobody would bring them in. So we ended up getting little Bela sharks from the pet store. But it was still really neat. It was just awesome. And so we centered it around it. And, you know, I got to thinking, and I was praying about this sermon this Sunday. And, you know, so we've been in, you know, as a church for over two years now. The second year, we didn't talk about Shark Week. So we kind of let it pass by. So I figured we'd get back to that talk about Shark Week this week. But this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip the script a little bit. And instead of the sharks coming against us, I'm going to put us in the position of the shark this week. So instead of us being, you know, trying to defend ourselves against the sharks, um, this week we're going to represent the sharks. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about. And, and the title for today's lesson is Temptation in the Waters. Temptation in the Waters. So that's, that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, what I want us to do today is I want us to stand together to read God's Word. You don't have to have your Bible on you because I would be willing to guess that probably most of us know this by heart. But let's put the script up there. For this Sunday, it's found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13. Anybody can tell me what that is? The Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer. And we probably all know it. So let's stand together and say this Lord's Prayer together this morning as we get started. This is where our passage is going to come from from today. So let's begin in verse 9 and let's read this together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. You may be seated. What a powerful passage of scripture. And you know, we all know it. And what's really funny is we read it in unison, so close as if we read it a million times together. Because the thing is, this is a very popular passage, right? The Lord's Prayer is, is heard all the time. You've probably maybe even recited it at certain churches you went to all the time. Um, but, you know, the interesting thing about this passage of Scripture is there's something right before it. And Christ is teaching the people how to pray. And he tells them something. He says, don't do vain repetitions like they do in the synagogues and stuff like that. So he's telling them, what I want you to do is don't do prayers over and over and over again. We don't need to do that. Now, you can, and I tell people that. But what you don't want to do is write the same thing down and read it verbatim to the point that it just becomes powerless. And you're just praying something just for the point to pray. You know, a lot of times you go into the Christian bookstores and they'll have so-and-so's prayer or, or so-and-so's prayer. And, and so you get these prayers and you read over them. The problem with that is, do you really mean what you're reading or are you just reading it hoping that you get the benefit of the person that read it the first time? Yep. So see, the biggest thing is, what we need to do, if you're going to use this prayer as your model prayer and you want to use that all the time as the prayer that you use, then that's great. But what you need to do is pay attention to what you're reading and not just pray it as a vain repetition. Does that make sense? So that's what Christ was telling him to do. But let's look at this prayer for a second, and let's take this apart. The first verse in verse 9 says, Our Father, this is Matthew chapter 6, if you want to turn there, by the way, as we're going through this. Um, but the first beginning of it says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, you hear this a lot of times in the churches still today. They'll go a lot by this prayer. Maybe not exactly the same, but I usually try to start my prayers a lot the same way. I'll say, God, thank you so much for the God that you are, for the awesome God that you are. And that you are God the Father. And so we say kind of the same thing. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You're such an awesome God. You can say it how you want to say it. What he says is this is the model prayer. 
This is the smart way to pray. This is things you need to pray for. doesn't mean you need to pray it the exact same way. It just means this is kind of a model to pray by. And then he says in verse 10, the second thing is, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. A lot of times you'll hear people pray that. They'll say, Lord, let your will be done here in everything that's done today. Let it be honoring to you in all that we do. Your will be done on earth here as it is just in heaven. The next thing he goes on to say is, give us this day our daily bread. That's important. We mess that up a lot. Because here's how we pray a lot of times. Dear Lord God, allow a BMW to be in my driveway. To my That's not what he said. What he said was, give us this day our daily bread. What does that mean? Give us this day what we need to get through this day. Nothing fancy, nothing superficial. All he says is, I mean, nothing super fancy. What, what he means is just what it takes to get through the day. Does that make sense? Give us this day our daily bread, what we need to get through today. And, and, you know, and God will bless based on what he knows we need. Does that make sense? So if he knows that you know what to do and that you would do right, if you were given a blessing that's a nice blessing, he'll give you that blessing. <laughs> And if it's in his time and in his will for that to happen, he'll do that. You know, God wants for us to live in abundance. Absolutely. But what we need to do is keep ourselves in check so we're responsible and ready for it when he does give it. Does that make sense? Yes. And God will give us our abundance if we're, if we're living that way. All right, and it's up to him. because it's, Now, see, here's the thing, too. Just because you live your life in such a way that brings responsibility, does that mean he's going to bless you and give you a big fancy house and a nice car? And a, not necessarily. He did me. Sometimes. He can do that. And, and he really did because we went and saw her house. It's amazing. And she's got a pool and everything else and finally got the lights turned on. So God can do amazing things. And a nice car. Too. Yeah, and a nice car. So you never know. God can do amazing things. But it requires us to get our lives in check. You know, so that's awesome. And the next thing it says is, and this is a hard one for us too. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's right. You realize what he's saying there? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us of the things we owe everyone else in the same way that we forgive those that owe us money. Interesting. And see, that's kind of like that whole forgiveness thing where, you know, they come in and they're, they're before God offering their offering. And he says, first go out and make it right with your brother. And then come in. See, we've got to be right with God in order for God to, to, you know, to bless us and things. So we, we understand that. And then the last one is the one we're going to focus on today. In verse 13, he says... And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's the one we're going to look at today. It, it's so important that, that Christ put this into his passage. He put it into his prayer that says, I want you, you know, this is a model prayer. This is something to go by. You don't have to pray this exact same thing, but I'm going to give you this model. Don't do think, don't pray in vain repetition, but I want to show you a way that you can pray. And he shows them the things and he puts temptation into there. He says it's so important that you be in prayer constantly over temptation. Can you imagine that? Because temptation is going to come. Um, you know, here's the thing. Sharks are an incredible animal, aren't they? I mean, they're amazing. And why are sharks so incredible? See, here's the thing. Are lions amazing too? Lions are an amazing animal, but they don't have lion weak. See? Isn't that interesting? The reason they don't have lion weak is because they're on land, right? So we can go and we can see lions anytime we want to. We can see them physically with our eyes. We can, we can watch them on the Serengetis and all this kind of stuff. We can see them running around and all that kind of stuff. But sharks are very fascinating. And one of the reasons why is because they're in a whole new dimension where we can't go. And so we're still learning things about the sharks as, as time goes by. And so they're in the water where we don't belong. See, we, we can have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and all that kind of stuff, but it makes it a little bit easier if we can walk right up to them, right? But, you know, so in the water, we're still learning about the depths. There's so many every time on Shark Week as it comes around. It's interesting to see all the new things they discovered because they can get down further now and they can do all this kind of stuff. So they see things differently. But sharks are an incredible animal because they pique our curiosity. We want to know more about them. There's so many different species, and we, we're constantly learning new things about them. And, and so that's what makes Shark Week so successful. That's why it keeps coming around, and everybody tunes in, because they're just such amazing creatures. And, you know, sharks have amazing senses that tell them what's in the water, and if it's dead or alive, and all this kind of stuff. One little tiny drop of blood in an Olympic-sized pool, and they can smell it. 
one drop of blood in an Olympic sized pool, they can smell it. And what's interesting is they have these two little tubes that run down their body that have hair in there. And so when something hits the water or it's splashing around, they can sense that. They sense the motion in the water, they can smell in the water. It was long thought that the way a shark worked was by their nose. Their nose was what kind of did everything. So they plugged up their nose and it seemed to prove to be true. They had a hard time finding their prey. But it's, it's interesting because they have all these senses that work together. And if you block any one of them, it affects them severely. And so that's just one of the ways that they, that they can smell what's in the water. So, so there's all these senses that work together, and we won't go over all of them. But here's the thing, another thing that's amazing about sharks. Each different shark species has a different favorite that they like. So each shark has its own like style of food that it really, that it really enjoys and that it goes after and all this kind of stuff. And, and, um, and as I was looking at this, I thought this was amazing. But tiger sharks, you know what a tiger shark loves? Leatherback sea turtle. That's what they love. That's what they'll go after. A leatherback sea turtle. That's their, their favorite food. So they'll chase that down and they'll go try to find it. And that's what their biggest temptation is. That's what they like the most. Just like great white sharks. We've all seen them. What do they go after? Seals and sea lions, right? And they'll breach the water after these things. And you'll see the seals trying to get away and all this kind of stuff. But that's what they love. That's what they go after. And then bull sharks, it's incredible because they love a stingray. You would think that that would be extremely painful trying to eat that. But guess what? That's their favorite food. That's what they go after. They love a stingray. Each shark has its own type of food that it really, really likes. But let me ask you a question. How many of you ever went fishing for sharks in here? How many have ever been fishing for sharks? How do you go fishing for shark? Or, or even watch the, you know, the shark week. How do you go fishing for it? You don't take it throw its favorite bait out there, right? That's not how it works. What you do is you chum the water up. So what you do is you put a lot of temptation into the water. And see, so what happens is you pour a bunch of, you know, not to be gory or anything, but you pour a lot of blood out there, and they call it a slick in the water. And so you make this big, huge slick in the water. Now what happens is that shark smells that blood in the water. And immediately it draws their attention. It's a major temptation. And you see, so that's how it works. They throw their temptation into the water. They show, throw a lot of blood in the water. They smell that and they immediately are turned towards it. And then what happens is once the sharks start to circling, depending on the kind of shark that you want to catch, you throw its favorite bait out there with a hook in it. And so see, what will happen is a shark can eat, uh, it, it can eat a stingray all day long. A bull shark can eat it all day long. No problem. But now there's a problem. Because this one specific one has a hook in it. And see, when that shark bites down on that stingray that's got the hook in it, then they yank that rope, you know, the, 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 to set the hook in the mouth, and now the hook is set and the battle is on. Because he's got it on the hook. And then what happens is they start to reel the shark in, reel the shark in until they finally get it in the boat, and then what do they do right away? They run to the taxidermist, right? To get a mold made of this thing so they can throw it up on the wall so they can make a display of the shark that they've caught, correct? Isn't that what happens? That's how it works? Here's the thing. Satan works in exactly the same way. That's what he loves to do. Satan loves to throw that temptation out in the water. And the truth is that even today, as you sit here in this place today, Satan is chumming your water with temptation right now while you're sitting in this building this morning. Yeah, he is. And, and, and I've seen it before. I've been in church sitting where you're sitting. Now, see, I can't lose my focus because I have to keep my focus. Otherwise, you'll throw tomatoes or something at me. But here's the deal. When you're sitting out there, you can be thinking about Perkins, which just shut down, by the way, so you can't get the food anymore. But, you know, you can be thinking about all these places. And, and so Satan's putting this temptation in your mind to tempt you away and all this kind of stuff. But, but you know, that's how Satan works. And, and so he loves to, to put the temptation in the water. And here's the deal. So much so... That Christ thought enough to put that in his prayer for us to model us, to teach us how we should pray. That, that God, don't lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's so important. God knew that there was going to be temptation. And the whole temptation, the fact of the temptation is that somewhere in the midst of that temptation is a hook that's set there to catch you. See, see, when you walk into a place where you don't belong and, and, and there's all these people around that don't even know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, Satan don't want them. You know why? He's already got them. That hook that's in that place is for you because you're a child of God and you know better. He's got that hook there waiting just to bait you. 
And it's amazing how Satan does that. And the word tempt, this is what's amazing to me. When I find a word and I start to do my, my research, you guys know how I am. I like to research things. I like to know why and how and, and put the reason behind all this stuff. Well, here's the interesting thing. The word tempt or temptation in its original is used 60 times throughout the scriptures, approximately 60 times. A little bit more than that, but I always go a little low on the low side. 60 times throughout the scripture. Do you think it's kind of important if he listed it 60 times? So if you go back to its original Greek or Hebrew, you know, or, or whatever, it's, it, that's really what you're going to look for. You look for the original base root to try to find out how many times it's used, approximately 60 times. And I think that's incredible that God wanted to mention that that many times. The, the fact is, or the truth is, that there's temptation in front of our face every single day as Christians. And so we have to be very, very careful that we need to be in prayer about that. The temptation's already in the water. You know, James chapter 1, verse 2, it's a great passage of Scripture, and it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or diverse temptation. What does that mean? Here's the important thing. I look at those little tiny words that are in that passage of Scripture, and I understand something. Notice it said when, not if. It doesn't say if you fall into temptation. It says when you fall into these temptations, because the truth is we're going to fall into temptation. It's there already. The blood is already in the water. The temptation is already in the water. And so we got to be extremely careful um, in our Christian lives and in our Christian walk with God all the time. Because the fact is that Satan is throwing temptation in the water all the time. And here's the thing. Just like a shark, Satan's too smart to throw your favorite bait into the water right up front. Why is that? You're a Christian. You're a child of God. You're going to see it from a mile away. If he throws his, your, your primary bait out there, he throws that in the water, you'll see it from a mile away and be like, uh-uh, not getting me this time. So what does he do? He starts throwing all kinds of temptation into the water to cloud your judgment, kind of like what you do with a shark. You throw so much blood in the water that it forgets there might be a hook in there, and it just goes after it because it starts a feeding frenzy. And so see, that's what Satan likes to do in our lives as well. What he does is he slips up the water, or he chums up our water with temptation, so much so that you don't realize there's a hook sitting there waiting to catch you. And, and you know this can happen so many ways. I don't know what your weaknesses are, but just like sharks, we all have our favorite bait. And guess what? The problem is, Satan knows it. Scriptures tell us he walks around like a roaring lion, just seeking whom he might catch whom he might be able to get his little fangs into, who he might get those hooks into. And, and, you know, I don't know what it could be. You know, it could be any number of things for you. Maybe it's sexual purity or, or immorality, those kinds of things. Maybe that's what it is, sexual integrity, and you're having a hard time with it or something like that. And here's how Satan likes to work. He'll work through any resource he can get. It can be a friend or anything. And watch this, because some of you may relate to this. It may be a phone call. Maybe you're sitting there on the couch and everything's going great. You've got your life in check and the phone rings. And all of a sudden, it's one of your best friends. And he says, hey, here's the deal. We're all getting ready to go out, shoot some pool, and we just want you to come along and shoot some pool. That's awesome, right? Is there anything wrong with shooting some pool? No. So you're like, maybe I'll go shoot some pool, but there's a problem that you don't even see is already happening. There's a bar in that pool hall. But you're like, well, it's okay because I'm not going to drink. I'm going to be okay. I'm fine. I'm not really going to pay any attention to this. I'm fine. So, so you go out there and you think this is going to be great, right? But then the problem starts to happen. And, and then the drinks start flowing around the table. And you see one and you're like, well, I know the scriptures say not to drink a strong drink and not to be given away to drunkenness. You know, maybe just one drink will be okay. And so you fall victim to that one drink. The temptation's in the water. Next thing you know, it's another one. And another one. And another one. And now your judgment is clouded. And what happens is the bait walks through the door. If, if, you're, if your hardest thing to deal with is sexual purity, then all of a sudden he gets your, your mind clouded and now the temptation walks in. So whatever it is, maybe it's a guy, maybe it's that perfect girl that you've always thought of, and now she walks in, she walks up to the bar and all this kind of stuff, and you just can't keep your mind off of her. And the next thing you know, you've forgotten about your wife that's back at home and all this kind of stuff, and you throw everything out the door for this one opportunity. That's how Satan works. He creeps in. When you just think that there's no chance anything's going to happen, I'll go, it'll be okay, one thing leads to another, and now the next thing you know, you're on the display rack for all the world to see. And that's what he loves to do. He loves to put a trophy on the wall so he can say, see, that Christian thought they were safe, but my temptation was too strong, and I threw them on my display rack. 
That's what Satan likes to do. He'll love to throw you up there on his display rack. You know, Madeline has this toy. I don't like the laugh of it in the one part. The one part you put this laugh on is like, ah, ha, 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 ha. It's not kind of creepy. The other one's okay. So I always put it on the other one because they'll sit there and laugh at all the time. Every time you push a button, it starts laughing. I think it's Satan that way. When he gets us on the wall, he's like, ha, ha, ha. Look at that one. I got him. And there he is. And you know what will happen? Because you're a Christian, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to be like, local celebrity from the church goes out and does it, and, you know, and he puts it on the world for all the world to see it. It's so quick the way the world will do that. Facebook. Absolutely. Facebook, who said that? <laughs> you know, and it could be something else. Maybe it's internal. Maybe it's internal for you. Maybe it's not even external. Maybe it's something as simple as anger. And, and so you have this problem with anger, and you say, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to fall victim to that anymore. I'm not going to let them get me anymore at your job or wherever it is that you're facing this anger. And you think, I'm not going to let them get me anymore. I'm not going to let them rent that space in my head, because that's literally what happens when you let someone get you angry. What that means is they're renting space in your head. Because now what happens is when you get angry, you're focusing on that, and you can't get that out of your mind, so they're renting space in your head. So you're like, I'm never going to let them rent that, rent that space in my head anymore. I'm not going to get angry when that happens again. And now what will happen is they'll find another way to kind of get your little goat and make you angry again. And now you get angry. And what happens is you start spouting off and saying things and acting in ways that would be completely ungodly that you would never do. And you allow it to get you again. Maybe it's more subtle. Even more subtle. Here's the thing. A lot of us, how many of you in here would admit that you have a pride problem? Don't raise your hands. How many of you would admit that you do have one? But here's the deal. The fact of the matter is, we all wrestle with pride, don't we? The truth be told, we all kind of struggle with that one just a little bit. And it's so hard to say it. We don't want to raise our hand and be like, Pastor, I do have a pride issue. But we know down inside we do. Why is that? Because our human nature is geared that way. It's geared to kind of showboat just a little bit, right? And so we want to show off and talk about all these things and all this kind of stuff. And it's okay to live in, to have lots of things, right? There's nothing wrong with that. God, God desires for us to live in a life of abundance. It says all through the scripture, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly, right? Where the problem is, is when you're like, look what I have. Look at all the things I've done. And as soon as we think of pride, we think, well, pastor, I really don't have a pride problem. That's for those people that have Italian leather shoes. That's for those people that pull up in the parking lot with the nicest BMW and take up two spots just to show up. That's for those people that come in in those fancy suits, you know, with those leather shoes on. You know, whatever it is, and we think that. But how about you? Have you ever seen this happen before? Where someone will walk in and they'll be like, I have the most humility in this church. I'm the most humble person. I'm so humble that I'm humbly humble. Right? And have you ever seen that? Where some people will act like they're so humble. But here's the thing. Can you be humble and, and be perfectly fine? Absolutely. But the problem is when you try to put that on display for the whole world to see, I'm so humble, I'm humbly humble, I'm the most humble person from that church, or, or whatever it is. And so we can throw that out there, and that can become an issue as well. There's so many things. So the temptation's in the water constantly, and we have to be extremely careful while we're going through that temptation. And here's the thing. Temptation affects us all. So we talked about it. The, it. It affects the rich that have everything. It affects the poor people that have very little and everyone in between because we like to showboat just a little bit. That's the way we are. It's in our nature. So we have to be so careful. What's so important to understand is that even Christ himself was tempted. And we all know the passage of scripture where Jesus Christ said to Satan himself, get away from me. It's not right to tempt the Lord your God, right? We all know that passage of Scripture where, where Christ said, you know, that you're not supposed to tempt the Lord your God. So we know that Christ Satan himself tempted God. And, and there's Scriptures that, that back it up. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, um, if you're writing these down, it says Hebrews 2, 18. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. It's important to understand that passage of Scripture. What he's saying is because Christ came and was tempted, he's able to help those who are tempted. Does that make sense? It's important to understand that because why, what did he tell us to do in the first place? To pray to God when we face temptation. And the reason we need to pray to God when we face temptation is because Christ himself faced temptation and he's able to help us since he's been there. It's basically like, I've been, you know, when you go and you sit down with someone and you say, I'm having a really hard time with drugs, they've never been there. So they have no idea what you're going through. 
You, and you sit there, and no matter how many times they say, oh, I completely understand where you're coming from, do they ever really know where you're coming from unless they've been there? Absolutely not. Christ himself was tempted in every way that we're tempted, so he is able to help us when we fall into that temptation because he can relate, and he's been there. Another passage of Scripture is found in Hebrews chapter 4, two chapters back from that chapter, in verses 14 and 16. And he says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest, being Christ Jesus, who has passed us through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. First, what's the confession? Our confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and he rose again and all that kind of stuff. So we hold fast to our confession in Jesus Christ. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Same exact thing, just a little bit more fancy than the last one. The last verse just simply said Christ was tempted the way we are, and so he can help us. This one here says he was tempted in all points that we are, yet without sin, because he never sinned, but he was tempted in every single way that we are. So it says, therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace, holding fast to your confession, to your faith in Jesus Christ, and he is able to help us in a time of need. You know, God's there for us. And he knows there's temptation in the water. And so what he wants us to do is when we start to face temptation, he wants us to immediately glue to him. To first hold to our confession that Jesus Christ is Lord, and secondly to go to him for help in a time of need. So here's the important thing that we need to understand. We know there's temptation in the water. We know we're going to face temptation. So the question is, when we do face temptation, how do we overcome that temptation? And here's the thing. If you got notes on it, I would encourage you to write this down. <coughs> I'm going to give you five steps to overcoming temptation. Five steps to overcoming temptation. They'll be on the board up here for you. So that way you can, you can kind of keep these in your mind. Write these down. Focus on whatever you do. If you don't write notes, but you can kind of remember, then do that. Put it in your memory and don't forget it. Five steps to overcoming temptation. Number one, the mo one of the probably the most powerful ways to overcome temptation is number one. Pray that God will give you wisdom and discernment to see the temptation and the strength to get through it. Pray that God will give you the wisdom and the discernment to see it. See, that's so important. This, absolutely. It's so important that we, that we have the discernment to see it and to understand it. We need to know when it's there. As soon as that temptation, we notice it's in the water, we need to immediately be going to God for prayer. Because what will happen is that little temptation has a hook somewhere floating around in the middle of it, just waiting to catch you off guard. If you're not careful, you'll end up on a display. So pray that God will give you the wisdom and the discernment to see the temptation and the strength to get through it. You will be tempted. It's not a matter of when, it's a matter of if. I mean, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. You are going to be tempted. Um, so be in prayer. We looked at two verses as we went through this passage today. We looked at two different verses that talked about how God has been tempted the same way that we are, yet he was without sin. So it's so important that we know that we're going to be tempted, um, but God is able to help us, so we need to be in prayer for him. Christ modeled a prayer for us called the Lord's Prayer. He told us how to pray, and that included temptation, and that he would deliver us from evil. So we need to be praying, number one, that he'll deliver us. Number two, when you sense temptation in the water... Keep your mouth shut. Keep your mouth shut. You know, that's an easy way to fall. When, when there's temptation in the water, um, it, it's, it's so quick that we want to go over there and we want to start running our mouths in things that we shouldn't be running our mouth, saying things that we shouldn't be saying, and all this kind of stuff. Don't go for the bait. The temptation's there simply to get your attention. That's all it's for. The temptation's there just simply to draw your attention in. But see, somewhere in the midst of there is a hook that's sitting there trying to catch you. So immediately when you sense temptation, you already know there's a bait somewhere with a hook in it waiting to catch you. Don't fall victim to that temptation. As soon as you start to see temptation, number one, start praying. Number two, keep that mouth shut so you don't get caught. Don't spout off and say things you're going to regret. Because once you say things, how many of you are married in here today? How many of you are married? As soon as you say something, can you take it back? Have you ever wanted to? Yeah. Once you say something and it's out there, you can never take it back. And it doesn't matter if it's your spouse. It doesn't matter if it's your boss. It doesn't matter if it's just someone around you 
that you're trying to spread the gospel to. One time that you open your mouth and spout off something, you can lose your, your, I mean, it's immediately, you're on the display wall. You're on the display wall and Satan's like, I've got you. You're on that wall. I told you I got you. And he's so quick to show us off. So don't spout off and say things we're going to regret. Even the first sin in history involved the mouth not being shut when it should have been. So much a little temptation, a little snake slithering through. Oh, did God really say? And they bit into it and started the sin of all mankind. Can you imagine that? So when you sense that, keep your mouth shut. You know there's a graphic for this. I'm sure you probably a lot of you have seen this. Even a fish can avoid problems if it keeps its mouth shut. Isn't that amazing? What a concept. Keep your mouth shut, you can't get the hook in it, right? That's kind of interesting. So I saw that and I had to put that up there because it's you know, kind of going with the fish theme and everything. And the next one, I want to even thank Disney for this one because this one comes from Disney. The number three is just keep swimming. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming. Come on, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. That's what we do, we swim, right? And so we all know that little Disney line, that little Disney slogan. Seriously, just keep swimming. That's what we need to do. We need to continue to do what God has called us to do, no matter what's going on around you. Don't pay attention to all the temptation that's in the water that's meant to draw you off course of what God's got planned for you to do. And if you're not careful, you'll get caught. What we need to do is just, just keep swimming. Don't pay it any mind. You know, the thing is, as a pastor, I think I've just about mastered this whole thing about social media by now. Because you know what people try to do when they know you're a pastor or a leader of a church or a music leader and whatever it is, however it works, you know what they like to do? Bait you in. They like to say something. And even throw it on your Facebook page. They'll throw something out there just to kind of get your goat a little bit. And get you caught up in a little conversation. You know what I do now? When I see something like that, I know they're just trying to bait me. I just delete it and keep going. Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. I didn't even see it. I just posted it half the time. I either act like I don't see it. Or I say, if you really want to talk to me about this, send me a private message where we can have a good civil conversation. Have you ever got caught up in one of those conversations on Facebook where someone tries to bait you and now you're trying to defend yourself and 30 people jump on you so quick and there's no other Christians coming to defend you? And now when you got caught, what's the problem? It's so hard to back back out now. Now I've learned this because now I don't do that. I don't pay any attention to that stuff if it's out in the open. I'll say, if you have a problem with it, do you really truly have a question, send me a private message and we'll talk about it. Or call me on the phone and we'll get into a discussion about it. And so that's what we'll do, and we'll discuss it and all this kind of stuff. And then once we finally reach a peaceful resolution, I'll post scriptures online that has to do with that. And so that way it's out there and all that kind of stuff, and it's so much easier that way. But the problem is, sometimes what we want to do is when we see something, we want to react, boom, and so we jump. And the next thing you know, we're caught in bait, and now the next thing you know, you're getting angry because of the whole situation, and now you're posting things you probably shouldn't be posting and saying things, and now he's got you on the wall. You've got to be careful. Number one, start praying as soon as you sense temptation in the water. Number two, keep your mouth shut. Number three, just keep swimming, focusing on the things that God has for you. Don't get caught up in all the temptation going on around you. Number four, never swim in murky water. Don't ever swim in murky water. With sharks, they tell you all the time, don't go out when it's murky. Don't go in that murky water. You can't see them coming. Same thing happens. Don't swim in murky water. Don't go places you're not supposed to be. If you don't go places you're not supposed to be, you won't get caught off guard. You know, there's so many times where, you know, as a younger Christian, I would find myself in places where I shouldn't be. Even the whole way there, driving there and driving back, I would hear my mother's prayers for me. God, deliver my son from the stupidness that he's about to do. And I can imagine her praying because I heard my mother pray some of those things before. And then, you know, I would sense my mother praying for me the whole way there, knowing I shouldn't be there. I had no business being in those places. But I chose to go anyway. And I felt the prayers of my mother every step of the way. And I pray that some of you heard those prayers as you were doing the same thing. I heard your mother praying for you. But you know, don't go places you're not supposed to go where you know you're going to get tempted. Why is that? Because if you're a child of God, you can bet Satan has his eyes on you. No one else there. He's already got him. Well, maybe the few Christians that also decided to swim in that murky water. But you've got to be careful. Don't go places where you know there's temptation that you know you're not supposed to be. And then you won't have those problems. And if you go where you shouldn't be going, you better believe there's going to be a hook. And it's sitting there. 
and it's got your name on the side. You ever see those little hooks that say China or USA? There's these hooks, and they got your name right on the side. And they're just waiting to catch you. And as soon as you open that mouth, and he, as soon as he gets your clouded judgment going, the next thing you know, he's got you on the wall. And number five, focus on what's important, and don't let the temptations of this world distract you. Focus on what's important, and don't let the temptations of this world distract you. You know, the, the temptations of this world are incredible, aren't they? You've all been there, you've all experienced them. They may smell great, they may look great, they may feel so good, and they may tickle every little sense that you have. But you know what the Bible says about the temptations of this world? They're so fleeting. They're just for a season. And it says that all through Scripture. The pleasures of this world are just for a season. But the things of God are for all eternity. Do you want to trade in eternal blessings for one little night of fun? Do you want to trade in God's hand of mercy and grace and compassion and forgiveness for one little moment of excitement in this world? I don't think so. If you're anything like me, you certainly don't want to. So it's not even worth it. So, so what we need to do is focus on the important things, and when the temptation starts to come, you're already focused. The Bible says set your minds on things above and not on things of this world, right? And that's what we need to do. Start focusing on what, what God's telling you to do, what God's plans are for your life. Start praying when the temptation starts sensing you. Keep your mouth shut, and then just keep swimming. Keep doing what God's calling you to do. Never look back and try to see what Satan's got all fancy, and, and don't ever swim in murky water and focus on all the important things, and the temptations of this world will never catch you standing.